It is often assumed that crowdfunding is a modern idea, one that has been made possible through the vastly enhanced communications afforded by the internet and other modern devices. However, the history of crowdfunding does not begin in the modern era. In fact, it was crowdfunding that allowed North Carolina to quickly shift from an agriculturally driven Rip Van Winkle state in the 19th century to one of the leading centers of manufacturing in the world in the 20th. Between the years of 1880 and 1900, a secular, evangelical, entrepreneurial movement established the textile, tobacco, and furniture industries that would sustain the state for a century. Subsequent industry consolidations and in-migrations of established firms obscured this entrepreneurial legacy. But the scale and scope of the phenomenon instituted a dispersed economic geography still affecting North Carolina today. Despite having an abundance of raw cotton to be processed into textiles, manufacturing in North Carolina had never developed much beyond the small-scale water-powered cotton mills scattered throughout the state along the streams and rivers. This was of course due to the relatively meek profits that could be made when compared with the plantation and farming operations throughout the state. The rising cost of cotton between 1840 and 1870 and the continuation of slavery made the meager profits created by manufacturing a poor alternative to cotton and other cash crops. Manufacturing in North Carolina during this period was used primarily as a buffer in the state's economy to diminish the impacts of fluctuations in the prices of cotton, tobacco, and other crops. With the abolition of slavery, much of the net worth of the state and its citizens ceased to exist, and many of the formerly highly profitable cash crops began to lose their appeal. The cotton mill campaign began as an effort by some of the wealthier investors and landowners in the state to push towards an alternative to the unstable agricultural sector. With the abolition of the slave trade and a drop in prices and cash crops, economic leaders in the state saw an opportunity to shift North Carolina's economy away from its dependence on agriculture and towards a new focus on industrialization, specifically in the production of textiles. While some textile mills had developed in the state, they were largely constrained to the waterways and rivers, as they were dependent on water to power the machinery. Business leaders in North Carolina wanted to shift away from this older model and to adopt the steam-powered machinery being used in the North. This effort would come to be known as the Cotton Mill Campaign, with a focus on its slogan, Bringing the Mills to the Fields. At the forefront of this effort was a young engineer, originally from South Carolina, who settled in Charlotte in 1883. As a representative of the Westinghouse Electric Company, Daniel Augustus Tompkins became a major leader in the cotton mill campaign, and used his newspaper, the Charlotte Observer, to promote the industrial efforts of his colleagues and to advocate for industrial development in the state. Perhaps his most important contribution to the cotton mill campaign was the development of a plan to utilize multiple small investors in small towns and rural areas to fund the construction of new cotton mills. Each new mill, with an investment goal of $100,000, was split into 1,000 shares, which were sold to investors at $100 each. Because capital was so limited, with very few examples of wealthy individuals, the investment plans were tailored to allow for many people of modest means to participate. In a form of democratic capitalism, the $100 shares were designed to be paid off at a rate of 50 cents a week over four years. While this practice likely slowed the rate at which the mills would go into production, it also enabled the development of many of the more profitably scaled factories in small towns across North Carolina. In this way, Tompkins and others sought to speed up the adoption of a new industrial economy in North Carolina, one dispersed throughout the state while maintaining local ownership of the factories. While the textile products produced in North Carolina were simpler and less profitable than those produced elsewhere in the country, the development of mills through local investors using local raw materials and local labor meant that a much greater percentage of the profits was captured locally. Tompkins would also lead efforts to establish a textile school at North Carolina Agricultural and Mechanical College, now North Carolina State University. Tompkins Hall on the university's campus is named in his honor. Tompkins' plan worked. 
between the years of 1885 and 1915, the number of mills in North Carolina grew from 60 to 318. Employment in the industry rose from 10,000 to 51,000. And by 1905, in-state ownership of the mills was at 90%. The cotton mill campaign also represented a shift away from traditional methods of production, such as water power, and towards the adoption of the newest technology of the time, steam-powered machinery. The first of this new wave of technologically advanced mills was the Mount Hecla Mill in Greensboro, named for the volcano of the same name in Iceland. By 1915, steam-powered mills had grown from only 16% of mills to more than 70%. By 1925, North Carolina had passed Massachusetts to become the leading textile manufacturer in the country. The specific development plans engineered during the cotton mill campaign also greatly influenced the development of North Carolina geographically. Towns such as Roanoke Rapids, Concord, Burlington, and Gastonia developed around new cotton mills, while large sections of other towns and cities such as Greensboro, Winston-Salem, Durham, and Charlotte developed around newly established mills. The crowd-funded mills throughout North Carolina served as a major factor in the development of the state's unique situation as simultaneously one of the most industrial and most rural. The rapid expansion of North Carolina's textile industry also gave rise to two of the state's other major industries, wood products and hosiery. Wood products for the mills and furniture for the homes of the workers quickly developed in a major industry in towns such as High Point, Thomasville, Lexington, Hickory, Salisbury, and Statesville. The cotton mill campaign marked a turning point in North Carolina's history, a turning point away from the agrarian and slavery dependent past towards an industrial future driven by textiles, furniture, and tobacco products. Over the next 100 years, these three industries would sustain the North Carolina economy while the utilization of local entrepreneurial efforts led to long-term wealth creation statewide. A new generation is now working to create our next economy. Where will they turn to to find the capital they need? History shows North Carolinians working together to build our past economy. What lessons does this experience offer the crowdfunders of today?